Well, if you've watched this channel for any amount of time, well, you know a couple things. One, I have a particular affinity to World War II, and uh, two, obviously I like to visit museums. But uh, I can't say that I've ever made a pre-visit to a museum before it has actually opened up. But that's what I'm getting ready to do today. Uh, I'm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and received an invitation to come out and look at some of the things that are going to be going into the uh, World War II American experience. Uh, this is a museum that's gonna be opening up uh, later on this year, uh, most likely in Gettysburg. And since I've been in Gettysburg, I've had numerous people tell me about the amazing collection of this family. So anyway, uh, we're getting ready to go in and take an advanced look at the World War II American experience in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. All right, uh, so I just walked into the place where Frank and, uh, and Lonnie and Adam have their collection, and holy smokes, right off the bat, as a collector, like my eyes are just darting all over the place seeing some pretty amazing things. Uh, so before we get out to the vehicles, I'm gonna show a few things in here. Now, there are just World War II helmets everywhere, right off the bat. Here's the one that my eyes were drawn to first. This is the actual helmet of General Mark Clark. Uh, the fact that they have this in their collection is insane and tells you a, a little bit about the the caliber of collection that, that we're going to be dealing with. Wow. So here are some more items that belong to Mark Clark. Uh, so you can see his overseas cap there. Uh, also, they have the flag that, that would have flown on his car. And it's right here in, in this collection. Amazing. All right, here's another one that if you didn't know what you were looking at, you would just probably pass right on by. Uh, this is a relic that was dug up on Omaha Beach. Um, some friends of theirs over in France dug this up and, and gave it to them. Gosh, have to wonder what that guy saw. All right, uh, this is just simply amazing. Here's another Omaha Beach helmet right here. Uh, and I mean, it, just as you, you go along, here's uh, somebody from the 82nd Airborne. Here's somebody from the 101st Airborne. Uh, what I'm really, really liking is it's not just collections of, you know, memorabilia and gear and uh, things like that, but, but they're preserving stories that, that go with the items. This is unbelievable. Dear heavens. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, this is the Foot Locker of Matthew Ridgway. And also his winter cap from whenever he served in Korea. All right, since we're already looking at helmets, here's another one that jumped out at me. You can see that this one got dinged a little bit. Uh, this is the helmet from a guy who was in the 3rd Armored Division and lived. Definitely a good thing that he was wearing his helmet at that moment.
All right, so those are just uh, a few of the items in this collection. Uh, the bigger items would probably be the vehicles. So I'm entering in <laughs> to uh, the next room and oh my goodness, vehicles, vehicles, vehicles everywhere. Uh, I don't even know exactly where to start here. Okay, uh, so I have just officially walked into Disneyland here. Uh, now, whenever it comes to military vehicles, uh, I have to admit that, that my knowledge is a little bit lacking. So I'm going to lean on the expertise of the, the people who really know what they're talking about. This is Frank and Lonnie and Adam Buck. Uh, this is their amazing collection. And uh, yeah, we're gonna kind of walk around and, and learn a little bit more about some of the vehicles from World War II. I also forgot to introduce Reagan. Yes, sir. Hey, dog. Hey, hey. What, what is wrong with you? <laughs> what are you looking at? Always had an interest in World War II, World War II vehicles, and the history itself. Uh, of course, I always wanted a, a nice World War II Jeep. This is the second one I purchased because of the condition it was in. I kept it. The first one was a $200 Jeep. This was a $595 Jeep to give you a different, you know, the, and this is back in the 60s. First Jeep I plowed snow with, the second one I just wanted is, is, is a nice original. So this has been in uh, our family ever since 1964. The three Jeeps over here were surplused out new at the end of the war in the box. Uh, we have a 45 Ford, 45 Willys, and a 44 Willys. The 44 Willys only has 2,900 original miles on it today. Wow. The, the Willys, the 45 is 5,000 miles, and the Ford over there is 6,000 miles. They were never in the service. They, they were new Jeeps when the owners bought them. And they were sur surplused out by the War Assets Commission in 1945. Huh. Original tires, top, seat cushions. You don't get them any nicer than that. Dang. Now, wh what were you just telling me about the grills? Uh, well, this particular Jeep right here is a 1941 Willys, and the grill on it is all welded together. It was put in a jig, and they welded it together. And then right after that, Ford came out with a pressed grill, as you can see in the other Jeeps here. Much easier and, and cheaper to construct, so even Willys moved over to the uh, Ford grill. They yeah. had many, many changes in the Jeep production during the war. Yeah, uh, that's, that's something I would have never picked up on. A couple hundred of them. Huh. So this vehicle right here is a 1941 Scout car, M3A1, built by the White Motor Company. It's a armored reconnaissance vehicle, and we used these in North Africa. We actually had them in the Philippines also, and they were captured there. Uh, we didn't use them past, I want to say, uh, the early part of the war. Uh, we then gave them to the, the French and the British. Uh, so essentially, the front of the vehicle, it's very reminiscent of a half-track. Uh, it's the same design and so forth. This vehicle's got a, ro a roller on the front that's left over First World War technology. Uh, in theory, if the vehicle would go into a trench, that roller would help propel the vehicle out out of the trench. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at that. You know, whenever I, I walked by, I saw that, but I didn't, yeah, didn't register like what it could, I would have never guessed that. Yeah, it's uh, you know kind of crazy to think that we were you know thinking about trenches uh, you know in World War II, but you know in the beginning of the war we were also worried about gas attacks. So, uh, but this vehicle it's hard to see with the top on, but it's got what's called a skate rail that travels around the entire perimeter of the the body here, and essentially what that allows uh, for is uh, two machine guns to travel around on a, on a trolley. Oh wow! Uh, Fifty caliber and a thirty caliber machine gun. And this has got armor uh, windows and doors here that fold up, you know, if you're in a hot area. Oh, dang. They're not going to stop anything too big, but they might help. And this armor uh, plate folds down in front of the windshield. Um, just, uh, you know, an early war design, you know, uh, that kind of carried us to the half track. Very cool.
Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just say it right now. There's no way I'm gonna be able to show all of these vehicles. Uh, whenever they get the museum opened, you're gonna have to just come and see them for yourself because there's, there's just way, way too much. Also, if you are into classic cars, there are plenty to be seen here as well. Uh, but anyway, moving into the next room and my gosh, <laughs> wall to wall World War II vehicles. Okay, so back here, uh, these are all World War II military vehicles. Uh, so this truck right here is a seven and a half ton wrecker. It's built by Ward La France. They were primarily a fire truck manufacturer uh, built in Elmira, New York. Uh, and this, this truck is completely restored, operational, even the boom on the back. Uh, actually, we've used that for a couple, couple of jobs. Uh, these trucks over here, uh, these two are built by Diamond T. Uh, that's another truck manufacturer that has um, since bit in the dust, um, you know, since World War II, unfortunately. Uh, so this one right here is also a wrecker. Uh, it's got a different wrecker unit on the back, twin booms, uh, built by the Ernest Holmes Company, uh, which was, is still a uh, you know, very popular uh, wrecker manufacturer. And this truck right here is a six ton prime mover built by Corbett Motor Trucks out of Henderson, North Carolina. And once again, another manufacturer of trucks that is no longer in business. So this truck would have been used primarily for pulling artillery and also the engineers used them to pull large equipment trailers with dozers and, and large equipment on them. But one of the, you know, the most significant vehicles in the collection is this truck. Uh, this is an M26 A1 tank recovery vehicle built by Pacific Car and Foundry Company. Uh, today, that company is known as Packar, which is the parent company of Peterbilt and Kenworth and Doff trucks. Uh, these trucks were built in Montana and they were nicknamed the Dragon Wagon. So essentially what it is is a, a large truck tractor that pulled a very large trailer that weighed 20 tons empty huh. and this vehicle's job was to go out into the battlefield after the battle had calmed down and in theory pick up or uh, recover the knocked out tanks because the American forces were losing so many tanks primarily Sherman's to the to the 88 millimeter guns that the Germans had so we had to rebuild our tanks and clean them up and send them back out into the battlefield with not five men, but four men because we were losing so many. So this vehicle uh, was meant to go out into the battlefield. It has a seven man crew that rides in it and operates it. It's got two very large winches on the back with one inch cable. And this truck is chain driven. The rear two axles are chain driven. So you have a chain that goes around on a gear and that's what transfer the, transfers the power to the wheels. Wow. And uh, one, one other note I'll make about this truck, it has an 1100 cubic inch engine built by Hall Scott. When you're driving this truck, the engine is right next to you. So you hear of cab over trucks, you know, where you're sitting over the cab, or sitting over the engine, I should say. This is an engine in the cab truck, and you only get about, oh, probably one, one and a half gallons per mile. That's the fuel economy on this vehicle. <laughs> Now, this, this is a beast of a vehicle that I didn't even know existed. Uh, and that's one thing that I'm really liking about the collection here is it's giving me kind of a, a broader perspective on the, the role that everybody played in World War II. So you, you think, you know, like Adam said, you know, there's a, a lot of tanks that are being knocked out during combat. You don't think about what happens to those tanks afterwards, that they have to be picked up and um, hauled back in and, and serviced and repurposed. All right, I'm going to try and get to the back of this thing and get a, get a better look at it. All right, here's a, a little bit different view of, uh, what, what's this vehicle called? The M26A1 Pacific. Okay, the M26A1 Pacific. And just think about the process to manufacture this beast. Okay, so Adam mentioned that it was it was chain driven. And you can see 
you can see those chains right there. Uh, I don't know if you can really tell on camera just what a behemoth this is, but to haul a, a Sherman tank out of the field, you can, you can only imagine. Very, very interesting. All right, well, here's the one that, uh, if you've watched the movie Fury, or if you're a World War II enthusiast of any kind, this is gonna be the one that is probably the most familiar to you. And uh, they have two of them in here. This is a 1945 M4A2 E8 Sherman. So it's nicknamed the Easy 8. The Easy 8s were the, the uh, later model of the Sherman that came out in 1944. Uh, it had wider track, slightly thicker armor, also a 76 millimeter gun uh, over the 75. So the 76 was the high velocity round. And uh, this had a five man crew, uh, your tank your driver, uh, your assistant driver, gunner, loader, and tank commander. And this particular tank was built by Fisher Body, which was a division of General Motors. And this one being an, an M4A2 E8, A2 meaning that it has General Motors diesel engines, two of them, uh, equaling 500 horsepower. This was more of an export model, and uh, also the Marine Corps used them as well. And uh, this one, uh, It'll fire right up. The, uh, the diesel engines uh, take no time to start. And uh, on the side here, it's got extra track blocks and uh, a pry bar and Pioneer tools that go on the back here. Man, that is amazing. All right, now, the, here's the Sherman that is just behind the one that we were just showing. And you might notice the the barrel on the gun is a little bit different. This is a 105 millimeter gun that is equipped on this Sherman. So larger round, more suitable for busting uh, bunkers or pillboxes, things like that. Uh, here is the 30 caliber machine gun that the, uh, was it, would the assistant driver? Yes. Is, is what would, or who would be positioned there? Okay. And, and you were telling me earlier about like the A3, A4, what's the, Designation. Designation. Yeah, what, what does that mean? Okay, so M4 means that it's a Sherman. Uh, some people might say it's an M4 Sherman. Well, every Sherman is an M4. M4 means it's a Sherman tank. Uh, the, the letters and numbers after that really tell you what specifically, what kind of Sherman it is. So an M4A3 Sherman would be uh, a Sherman tank with welded sides like this, not cast. Cast holes were rounded. Uh, this is a welded hole, so it has the angles here and the weld marks. Uh, so this is an M4A3 E8. The E8 means that it's the upgraded version, the Easy 8, uh, the nickname as they, as they say. So the, the Easy 8 or the E8 had what they call horizontal volute spring suspension. So you had wider track and then the springs back here, instead of being vertical like on the earlier Shermans, which were vertical volute spring suspension, they were horizontal. And you also had an upgraded version of the bogey wheels uh, as it was a uh, wider track and so forth. And the armor was slightly thicker. And with the Easy 8 uh, also came out with the, uh, the 76 millimeter gun. And obvious, obviously this one has a 105, um, but there were other variants of the Sherman. Uh, the one in front of it is a, an M4A2 E8. So the A2 means that it has twin General Motors diesel engines. And, and both of these are both E8s because they're easy 8s but uh, they were M4A1 Shermans which were cast hull. Uh, the, the hull was one cast piece and it was rounded and uh, they also made those uh, in an easy 8 model. You had 
M4A4 models, which had a uh, Chrysler multi-bank engine, where essentially the engine uh, in that tank was, I want to say it was five different engine blocks, Chrysler engine blocks, uh, mounted together to create one tank engine. Uh, really a nightmare if you wanted to change a spark plug on that bottom <laughs> portion. All right, so yeah, this is why this is why I'm uh, walking around with these guys because uh, that is so far beyond me. Um, can I can I go inside? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Let's go up in this one. Okay, um, up here on the turret right now, and one thing that Adam was telling me that I found interesting that I hadn't really thought about before, now let me get up here. If you pop the hatch on this thing, it has what's called a combat latch to where you could lock that from the inside and uh, obviously that's to keep uh, any enemy from popping the hatch open and uh, dropping a grenade in your lap. All right, here we go. All right, let's see if we can kind of squeeze ourselves down in here. Ugh. <laughs> Oh, wow. This is uh, tight quarters for sure. Uh, but yeah, this is the, the inside of a Sherman tank if you've never seen one. Very cool. We're, we're gonna get Adam down here and have him kind of walk us through who would be where in, in one of these vehicles. Okay, so I am sitting where the, the gunner would be in the tank. So where I'm sitting, my job is to identify the target and essentially fire the round um, and traverse the turret, elevate the gun, so forth. So I'm operating the gun. Uh, where you are uh, seated, JD, that's where the loader would be. So you would be in charge of loading the shells into the gun and then behind me, there are two seats that are in their oh, okay. yeah. folded position right now. Uh, but that is for the tank commander. So there, he, he, he would be directing the tank here, uh, communicating with the other tanks in the company. Uh, if he's in, you know, ahead of the company, uh, commanding all the tanks. Uh, and there's two seats. He can either sit in the lower position uh, or the one above, he can uh, sit in and uh, look out of the hatch here okay. uh, if it's not too hot of an area, if they're not in combat. Um, but there's several periscopes uh, in this tank uh, for each of the members to look out of, uh, such as that one right there. And then below that is a 30 caliber machine gun that the gunner would operate as well okay. as the main gun. And then, obviously, the main gun is uh, next to it here. Man, I had no idea that, like, they were this close to the gun. Oh yes, in, in these turrets. Yeah, we, I, I guess it makes sense. That's kind of a dumb thing to say, but once you get in here, you you really uh, get a greater appreciation for it. I guess I should say. Absolutely, and uh, there's a little bit more space in this. Uh, Sherman compared to a, an earlier one. Oh wow! Or even a Stewart tank, uh, which was a light, a light tank, and that only had a four-man crew. Okay. Uh, so it, it it definitely varied, but uh, you know, it's there's no no luxury about this. No. Where uh, where's the like in this one be seventy-six millimeter? Yep. Where where would the ammunition be? Okay, so we have this box down here, which has uh, about a half a dozen rounds in it, but. Um, this tank uh, had what was called wet stowage, so the shells were actually kept in, in the bottom of the, the hole of the tank, uh, so okay. essentially right below us, and you could open up the compartments and pull the rounds out, and they were uh, stored in, in a liquid that would, um, you know, mitigate against, uh, you know, 
an excessive amount of explosions if a round hit the tank. Okay. Uh, all the rounds were submerged, uh, you know, to help prevent essentially a catastrophe. Okay. So who's who's sitting down here? So that would be the driver on the left and then the assistant driver on the right. Okay. And this thing's got a uh, five-speed manual transmission and uh, two steering levers. And it's essentially it's like driving a large truck mixed with a bulldozer. <laughs> All right, very, very cool. All right, so this is actually my first time ever being in a Sherman tank. Here's, here's one thing that, that really jumps out at me. And, and for people who may know, you may this may sound dumb, but I, I knew that the space was tight in here. I didn't know it was as tight as what it is. There, there is not much room to maneuver or, or move around uh, in, in this tank. Uh, whenever you watch the movie Fury, they, they make it look like it's this giant open compartment where you can almost like get up and walk around. And, and that is not the case. Like once you're in here, you're in here. Uh, and you're in your spot. There's not a lot of, not a lot of movement that could happen here. But yeah, very interesting to see the perspective from from inside this thing. All right. <laughs> uh, well, this has been quite the nice surprise. Uh, th this is unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire life uh, this this collection um, I, I love people who uh, are passionate about history and 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 collecting and uh, beyond that sharing that history and helping other people to to learn the, these guys uh, are, are preservationists is what they are uh, they're, they're keeping the history of World War II alive by by keeping these these vehicles uh, up and in working order and are going to be sharing that knowledge at the World War II American Experience right here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So at the time that I'm filming this, it is March of 2021. They're hoping to open later on this year. So if you come to Gettysburg, well, you're probably a military history fan already. Definitely come to this place because what they are going to be doing is beyond amazing. Loved, loved this experience. Well, if you've watched this channel for any amount of time, you probably know two things. One, well, I have a particular hatred of geese. That's the third thing. Dang geese. 